All right, everyone. Thanks for uh, logging in this morning and joining us for the Badger Institute Symposium Series, uh, talking about the budget, uh, the challenges we have ahead. Uh, my name is David Flatimo. I am the Public Affairs Associate for the Badger Institute. Uh, my job is to work in the Capitol with legislators, uh, pushing our legislator, pushing our policies, our um, ideas, our research. Uh, work with policymakers, staff, outside groups to uh, make those a reality. Um, I think we've gotten a lot of new interest from some folks. I know we're streaming on Wisconsin Eye as well as our Facebook page. So for folks who are not aware of the Badger Institute, uh, we are a nonprofit think tank based in Milwaukee. Um, we push for free market ideas to lessen government regulations and burdens and try and provide opportunity and prosperity for all Wisconsinites. Um, our five main areas of research are taxes, transportation, federalism, occupational licensing, and criminal justice reform. Um, so we, hope we work on a host of other issues across the board, but those are kind of our five main areas of uh, topic. Um, and when we talk about all those areas of policy and issues, um, pretty much all of them get covered by the state budget. Uh, the state budget, as we all know, every two years, uh, the governor introduces and the legislature and joint finance committee uh, work to edit and refine the process. Um, overall, it takes close to a year between the administration's work and the legislature's work uh, to pass a budget that spends tens of billions of dollars and affects pretty much all aspects of uh, Wisconsin life. So um, with that, you know, this year with COVID, um, obviously some new challenges are being presented to the budget process. It's a complex process to begin with, but it may be more complex by kind of a double-headed monster that's facing the state budget right now. Uh, we've seen the stories of decreased uh, tax revenue due to the economic shutdown and the continued recovery of most sectors of the economy. Um, so there's less money coming in the door, but then there's also higher expenses between unemployment insurance and Medicaid, Badger Care Plus enrollments going through the roof. Um, you've got kind of uh, challenges coming from both ends, both on the revenue and on the spending side. So I think it's gonna present uh, legislators with uh, some unique challenges this session that they haven't had to face in the past. Um, so today we wanted to bring in uh, co-chairman of the Joint Finance Committee, John Nigren. Uh, he's been co-chair since 2013. He was first elected in 2006 and almost immediately became integral in the budget process. A uh, few people have been as involved or as knowledgeable about the budget process, where we stand, where we're going, and the challenges we face as Representative Nigren. Um, real quick, today we're going to have him give a quick presentation on, uh, like I said, where we stand, where we're going, and uh, some of the challenges we face. So he'll give a quick presentation, and then we want to take questions from the audience. So um, at the bottom of your screen in the Q&A button, you can click on that, uh, submit questions. We've had a few questions that were submitted ahead of time. Uh, that we'll try to get through as many as we possibly can, hopefully as much time as we can for a Q&A at the end of the presentation, and it will be done by 11 o'clock. Um, like I said, this is a series of events that the Badger Institute is putting on to draw attention to our issues and um, give information to the public, public policymakers uh, at the federal, state, and local levels, um, and anyone who's interested in learning more about how state government functions and can be improved. So with this, we're going to be doing another one of these events, uh, September 23rd, I believe, and, uh, over Zoom again. Uh, Missouri passed a bill on occupational licensing, universal recognition, that we want to talk to um, one of the legislators about how we're, that could be a model for what happens here in Wisconsin. Um, and then on the budget, like I said, it's a document that's produced by the governor, uh, sent to the legislature. We've also invited the governor's office and administration to come on in a similar uh, format to talk about what they see as uh, the current situation and how they plan to address it in the next session. Mm -hmm. So hopefully uh, we have not received response from them yet, uh, but hopefully we will be able to get somebody from the administration eventually on to talk about this as well. So stay tuned for that. Um, also for questions today, you can also email us if you're watching on the streaming services at uh, Badger Institute, info at badgerinstitute.org. Um, and for any information about our organization, our research, our upcoming events, uh, badgerinstitute.org is our website, at Badger Institute on Twitter, and you can also find us on Facebook. So without any further ado, I want to pass it over to uh, Representative John Nigren, co-chair of the Joint Finance Committee. Thanks for joining us today, Representative. Thanks, Flat. Uh, 
Good morning. Good to be with everybody. Uh, we'd obviously prefer to be doing this in person, um, but this is the new world we're in. I think all of us have been probably on our fair share of Zoom calls over the last uh, few months, uh, so it's be kind of become our new reality. Uh, as Flat had mentioned, obviously, um, the COVID world has had impacts on uh, finances for everyone, for uh, families, for businesses, and state government and federal government is no, no different. Um, having said that, I think the realities for Wisconsin is we're in a better position than I would have even thought um, when this all began back in March and April. Uh, first month, uh, revenues were down, I believe, almost $800 million over the April before that. Uh, April April of 2020, about almost $800 million down from April of 2019. And, you know, a little bit of fear, I think, began to set in for everyone uh, bec because of that. And uh, the reality is, is that I think the uh, reporting uh, filing deadline for the federal tax the deadline of uh, moving to moving to July had an impact on uh, uh, on our revenues early on. They have stabilized over, over time. Not to say that we don't have difficult uh, uh, decisions ahead of us, yet I do think we're in a more stable position than we had originally thought. And quite honestly, that's because of decisions that the, the Republican legislature has made uh, over the last 10 years. Our rainy day fund, as you see on the slide in front of you, is at $650 million, it's the highest amount ever. Uh, when we began uh, in 2011, it was basically zero. So, uh, and it actually was projected uh, based on revenues from the last budget uh, to hit about a billion dollars, uh, but those are projections. We know the reality uh, revenues did uh, take a sharp decline and because of that, we're at 650 right now with potentially making a, a, another deposit here in the near, near future uh, to help us make decisions in the next budget. They're gonna be very, very complicated and very, very difficult. Our gap deficit has also been cut by 74% since 2011. Um, that's generally accepted accounting principles versus the cash uh, 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 accrual basis where the state government currently um, reports. Uh, so that's more of inside baseball issue, uh, issue for a lot of people, but uh, it still has seen a 74% reduction in that gap deficit since 2011. Uh, the 2019-2021 biennium uh, will end with over a billion dollars uh, in the ending balance. Uh, I believe the number will probably end up around $1.2 billion would be in the ending balance moving into the second year of the budget, which we're already in. Um, of course, government the reporting always you know, lags a little bit. We do expect to see another report here uh, wrapping up uh, 2019 or the first year of the budget um, very, very quickly here. Uh, our tax burden in, in, at the same time that we've uh, kind of put ourselves in this better financial position is also at a 50 year low. So you can do both. You can manage the the finances of the state in, in an appropriate manner. You can fund our priorities uh, and yet still keep uh, your tax burden low. Um, on the left on the screen, you can see <clears throat> the gap deficit over time. And on the right, uh, the cumulative uh, savings that, that citizens of Wisconsin um, median family have seen uh, since 2013, uh, cumulatively about uh, 2000, over $2,000 in, in savings. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So I, I think one of the morals of the story in this conversation is, uh, as Flat had talked about, so we are in a world now, uh, previously we had worked with um, you know, Governor Walker, now we're working with Governor Evers, split government. Uh, I think the moral of the story here is the legislature's role in, the, in these conversations with budgets are even more important today. Uh, Governor Evers had a budget uh, proposal that increased spending by 8%. We have increased taxes by over a billion dollars and increased that da gap deficit that we had talked about by uh, nearly $2 billion. There was a lot of pressure from the legislature, I mean, you know, to, to go along with the governor in some of those cases. There's you know, things like such as K-12 education funding, um, uh, increased uh, reimbursement for special ed, for example. You know, there, there are things in there that uh, you know were, were popular with the public, yet we also have to make decisions that are based on the financial health of the state. Um, so while we increased uh, funding for education, we increased the reimbursement for uh, special ed, we didn't uh, go to the full extent of, of where Governor Evers was. And I, I think uh, in the long run, that is gonna prove out to be a very, very wise decision. 
Uh, just like families and businesses, live in your means. You don't spend every dollar you have. You try and save for uh, a rainy day. Well, right now, it, not only is it raining outside here, but it's uh, it's it's the storm is upon us as a as a as a world nation and, and as a state. So, uh, some tough times, some tough decisions are ahead of us, and I feel much better about heading into uh, uh, the next budget, having that rainy day fund. Um, living within our means as a state than I would have if we would have uh, followed the governor's direction uh, with his budget proposal. Um, in addition, you know, when COVID first hit in March, uh, Governor Evers had a proposal to um, that would have made our financial con condition even worse. Uh, he asked for a billion dollars from state government, um, which would basically have been like a blank check. There wasn't any a lot of specificity to it. Um, even though the, uh, he was asking for that, even though the federal government uh, gave Wisconsin nearly $2 billion to deal with COVID and that $2 billion is, does not have legislative oversight. Uh, he is actually the sole arbitrator, him and his administration of how those dollars are spent. So uh, once again, the legislat legislature uh, resisted the call to spend that additional billion dollars on COVID. And once again, I think that was a wise call. Uh, last I saw, I don't think the governor had even allocated a hundred million dollars of the $2 billion that he's got available to him for COVID. Uh, so uh, that obviously that those state resources were not necessary uh, for us to address the, the pandemic we're facing that we're facing today. Um, next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, as a result of the stay at home order, tax collections have declined and will continue to decline. Um, that, that goes back to the, through June, the number I talked about earlier, collections were about $749 million lower than the previous year. And it's largely, as I said earlier, due to the tax filing deadline being shifted uh, in, into July. Uh, sales tax collections do remain strong. Uh, but, but do not entirely help the general fund. And the reason for that is, uh, is that online sales tax collection, um, when we, uh, the federal government or Supreme Court ruled on uh, online sales collection, uh, Wisconsin decided to use uh, that, that money that was coming to us to reduce the lowest two brackets uh, for tax filers in Wisconsin. We've, of course, we always want to put more money into people's, people's hands for them to be able to make decisions that are best for them. Uh, online sales have uh, obviously shot up but during the pandemic. Uh, they were up 100% in May of 2020 compared to May of 2019. While all this, a lot of this news so far has been positive, uh, and we'll finish the biennium with a positive ending balance, I, the second year of the budget is where you're going to feel the most impact. Um, and I, I think because of that, it, it's also a uh, opportunity for us to, uh, to take the, this, this very conversation very seriously and exercise some caution. Uh, I would have uh, liked to see this be a little bit more aggressive over the last few months in, in reducing our expenditures as a state, especially in the second year of the budget. Uh, we called for a freeze on spending in the second year of the budget, holding it flat versus the um, versus the, uh, compared to the first year. Uh, but unfortunately, that hasn't happened. And the reason I think that would, is important to, for us to uh, address that issue is if we don't make uh, reductions in this uh, second year of the budget, um, even though we are in a better position than we originally thought, the full impact is going to be felt as we roll into the next budget in 2021. So I, I, I think the more we do now, if I was uh, providing advice to anybody on the line that might be uh, in, in government, whether it be school, whether it be a school or wherever you might be, uh, reducing your costs today so that you have cash on hand to be able to weather the tough decisions that are going to be uh, facing the legislature and the governor in 2021. That would be the best advice I could I could give. Next slide, please. So. Uh, some of the biggest expenditures that we face as a state, number one, is always uh, K-12 education, uh, right, rightfully so. Um, and that's why I think there's always a, a significant fear uh, from our public schools anytime we're in a difficult financial situation. Um, because honestly, it's one of the few levers that the state government has to uh, uh, move one way or another in, in a, in a, in a uh, budget shortfall situation. Uh, our MA funding is, is number two. You can see that almost $7 billion of GPR, almost $12 billion of Fed. 
uh, that, that are spent on that. Fortunately, we have what's called a maintenance of effort where we basically are locked in at least at what we spent last, last budget on MA. And you can see the cost to uh, continue, no additional programs, um, just continuing what we're currently doing. The cost to continue is uh, over $300 million in GPR and over uh, nearly $400 million in Fed uh, just to keep you know, the status quo. Anytime we do see a significant downturn in the in, in our economy, it's also a time where we see growth in our Medicaid programs. And you can see that in March and uh, July, uh, between March and July, we grew our enrollments by about 13%. DHS predicts about 22% uh, growth in the enrollments by the end of the current budget year that we're, that we're in. Now, at the same time, I, we've also heard because of um, the reaction to COVID, there, there's less utilization than there's been in the past, uh, but I don't expect that to be a long, long-term long uh, factor. I would expect that some of those situations are deferred uh, treatments that will end up uh, still having to have a budgetary effect in, in the future. So it's not like we're, we're saving m- uh, money long-term on our Medicaid programs, even though we've seen a slight um, uh, savings uh, recently from, uh, from, our, from DHS. Uh, also, um, DHS does predict that they will have a slight surplus at the end of the budget, but uh, part of that is, is due to the increased uh, federal reimbursement rate or FMAP that we, uh, we got uh, based on the Federal CARES Act that was passed uh, by Congress. Uh, future growth and decline, uh, future growth decline in the Medicaid budget will have a serious uh, impact on our uh, our overall budget. Uh, a lot of my colleagues have, have made comparisons in the past that basically the uh, in the last recession that we saw, pretty much every dollar that was um, in- increased dollars for M- M- had to come from somewhere else. And awful, oftentimes those are, are not great uh, decisions that, that uh, we have in, fr- in front of us. So anything we can do to reduce uh, the, the AMA uh, implications is, is definitely uh, will make an impact on things such as schools and other priorities that the state has. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said earlier, we should act sooner rather than later to reduce the pressure on that next state budget. Uh, the it, this spring, Governor Evers announced a re, uh, reduction in the current uh, cuts to current agencies at 5% was its original number that, that got a lot of media. Unfortunately, uh, the total cut was only $70 million, and 40 of that came from the UW system. State agencies were a, um, actually cut only about 1%, so uh, no, nowhere near the 5% that was touted that we were going to see savings from the administration uh, when the... Uh, when that was first announced. Uh, more recently, Montgomery was also announced a $250 million cut uh, to state agencies with not a lot of detail, no specifics. So we're kind of waiting to see where that, uh, that plays out. Um, all these actions, the revenues um, being stronger than we had originally anticipated, um, while not great, stronger than we had originally anticipated, may put us in a situation where we don't need a budget repair bill in this current uh, uh, biennium, but will do little to improve the outlook for the 2021-2023 budgets. That's where I go back and say, if you're if you're operating under your current uh, you know, f- financial structure, if you're current, if you're um, operating under a growth in in expen- expenditures, uh, I would do everything within my power to be able to reduce those expenditures currently, keep them as, as uh, low as possible so that you have some cushion going into the next budget where the state, it would appear, will have the uh, most significant impact on our, our our budget will be felt in the 2021, 2021, 2023 budget year. Uh, in addition, you know, while it's a segregated fund, transportation fund revenues are also seeing uh, uh, reduced revenues, of course, people are traveling less. Uh, fuel tax and title collection fees are down about $100 million. Uh, DOT is delaying road funding to address uh, that shortfall. The next slide, please. Okay, Medicaid assistance and school aids are, um, as I just mentioned earlier, the most significant portion of the state budget. Uh, in the 1921 budget, it was 75% of our general fund spending uh, were those two programs. Uh, after the Great Recession, the state needed uh, $1.2 billion in state funding to offset reductions from the federal government. A uh, federal CARES Act, um, and this is where we have to be very, very careful, um, even though it's uh, a complete uh, 
control of, of Governor Evers, we have to be very careful that we don't build our budgets around federal resources that end up going away in the future. That happened. Uh, you remember the stimulus money back in uh, the last uh, Great Recession. Uh, Governor Doyle actually built his budget around those resources. And then when Governor Walker came in, those resources were gone. So you know, we needed to be able to make decisions uh, that were, uh, were difficult, but uh, important to, for us to be able to balance our budget. Uh, getting through the next uh, 10 uh, months without a budget repair does not mean Wisconsin will be in the clear, as I, I've tried to emphasize over and over again. It will simply move the uh, tough decisions into the next budget discussions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some key dates to be looking for um, towards in the, in the near future. Uh, late in August, as I mentioned earlier, uh, DOR and LFB will uh, issue a final 2019-2020 collections data uh, where we can basically close the books on 1920. Uh, September 15th, the agency budget request, uh, which will include uh, MA Medicaid ass assistance estimates will be, will be coming out. October 15th, uh, the annual fiscal report with the final 1921 uh, expenditures and revenues. So we'll be able to completely uh, wrap everything up there. Uh, and October 20th, the Wayfair individual income tax uh, cut submitted to joint finance. As I mentioned earlier, the uh, online sales tax is being used to offset or to re uh, reduce the uh, uh, lowest two brackets in income tax uh, based on previous decisions. Uh, November 20th, uh, compiled report with agency budget requests. That's where we got to start preparing for the next round of budget deliberations that'll begin in November. Uh, and then late in January, uh, Legislative Fiscal Bureau will provide 2021 revenue estimates. That's when the full picture of what we anticipate happening uh, in will shape a lot of our budget discussions. That's when we'll really begin to uh, take shape. In late uh, January, early February, Governor Ebers will introduce his his budget, and then from there, as Flad said, began the conversation. He, he introduces his budget. It goes to the legislature, the Joint Finance Committee, where we begin to make decisions on line items and policy decisions within that state budget with a goal. You know, Flad said almost a year, uh, maybe a, a year from uh, when the governor begins to when we, when we wrap up. But uh, God help us if we have to have uh, budget uh, negotiations in the legislature for a year. Uh, last budget, I would point out that even with split house, or, or split government where the legislature is Republican and the governor is Democrat, we were able to get a budget signed into law basically uh, right on time. Um, you know, Governor Eber signed the, the budget that came out of joint finance into law, of course, with some vetoes, but uh, uh, pretty astounding accomplishment for the legislature to be able to get that budget passed on time with uh, now shared government. I think that's probably our last slide and it probably rolled us right into questions. Is that right? Last slide. Yep. Yep. That's correct. Okay. All right. Go. Go for it, Vlad. All right. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, all the participants on the call um, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q and A button. Uh, you can submit your questions there, and we will try and get through them as much as possible. Um, anyone not on the Zoom call and streaming from WSI or our Facebook page, uh, you can email us at info at badgerinstitute.org. and we are monitoring that for any questions, and we will try and get through as many of those as possible. Um, real quick, one of the things you didn't touch on much, and I know it's been a topic you've been doing a lot of uh, work on in the last couple months, but uh, on unemployment insurance, we're facing a pretty big backlog of people getting their payments in the first place, but then there's a problem of how do we make sure the fund is, is, is available and taking care of the people that are being hurt the most in this uh, economic shutdown. So. Um, can you just give us a quick update on where we're at with, you know, kind of making payments, DWD, and then um, what the thoughts are on the future? Is the state going to have to bail out the fund or the feds or, or what's, what's, what's the situation? Well, um, the good news is going into this, uh, into the COVID uh, economic downturn, uh, the fund was in far better shape than it had been in recent history. So that, so that's a positive uh, I think the biggest thing that we've taken away from the last few months is how we need to do a better job of uh, reforming our system to make sure that we're able to address these uh, situations like this in a timely manner. Uh, Pete, there's, there's, the administration will claim that they've got very few cases left from March. I think they said they had maybe five to 10 cases. 
I've got five to 10 cases from original filings in March that are my constituents alone, and there's 99 assembly districts in the state. So it's, it's a much larger problem than they are, uh, are leaving or they're, are they're publicly stating. Um, and, and, you know, we don't want to be adversarial in this. We want to be able to find a pathway that addresses these people's concerns. I mean, we've been on the phone with constituents who are, I, there's a gentleman just recently, we were actually able to help him. He was down to $18 in his checking account. And when the, when the payment kind of finally came through, it, we've been we've had uh, constituents call us who unfortunately um, had already lost their house by the time the payments came through. So whether it be extending call center hours, whether it be hiring additional staff, and we've tried to provide advice and direction and, and, and flexibility uh, that the governor governor and, and uh, the secretary have asked for. Um, We've tried to, tried to provide suggestions. We even said, Governor Evers, you get $2 billion. Um, as we know, some of it has never been uh, allocated yet. You get $2 billion. Uh, how about if we do a uh, interest-free loan to these folks that are waiting adjudication, meaning these are some of the more complicated um, decisions that have to go through the process. You know what, if you're sitting there waiting for some bureaucrat to make the decision on whether or not you get unemployment or not, unfortunately, the people you're paying your bills to, the mortgage company, um, you know, your car payment, whatever it might be, they're not going to have the same level of expectation that you sit and wait wait patiently as unfortunately DB, uh, DWD has had with these folks on unemployment. So uh, it's something we're continuing to monitor. The um, the information coming from DWD, like I said, seems to paint a rosier picture than what we see. Um, I've talked about the uh, number of cases that are still left from March, uh, yet it, we also are hearing that the number, the length of time between filing and actually uh, payment is actually going up, not down. So it's going to continue to uh, be an issue that we're going to have to um, stay on top of and, and hopefully find a pathway that addresses these, these constituents' concerns because um, many of these people are unemployed for the first time in their life ever. These are people that uh, need the uh, resources that we, that we ha have through unemployment and we need to be able to get to them, get them to, uh, to them. As far as whether or not um, we're going to need money from uh, to, ba to bail out the, the fund, I think it's too early to say. I mean, in, in, during the last recession, we did end up borrowing money from the, the federal government to uh, keep the, the uh, unemployment fund solvent. If we have to do that again, that'll be a conversation we have. But if you also, you also might remember that we also, as our economy came back, it bounced back, we had more resources available to us. We also deposited money into that fund, GPR, so that we wouldn't have all this burden to simply fall on small businesses who have, I mean, you know, taken the brunt of this uh, downturn in the economy as well um, and are oftentimes on the edge of being able to open tomorrow. Um, and so we can't just simply think that uh, business is going to bail us all out uh, on, on the unemployment fund. We have, we as government need to be accountable as well. Okay. Um, speaking of the federal money that came in, um, Wisconsin got about $2 billion, I think according to LFB, about 1.75 billion has been allocated so far. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk, you know, that the governor had pretty much free reign to spend the money how he saw fit. Um, has there been any discussion with the legislature, with the Joint Finance Committee about where some of that money's going? Uh, well, there's a lot of conversation with the Joint Finance Committee and where it's going. Unfortunately, we, we have no oversight and, and that's, um, and there hasn't been a lot of information shared. Basically, the information the Joint Finance Committee has gotten is basically the same as what you've seen in the media. And that's there's not a lot of detail with that. Um, I, you know, I, I, if I had my congressional delegation friends in the room for a, a short period of time, uh, I would uh, certainly advocate for um, more of a, you know, in, if there's Future Cares Act or whatever they, acronym they want to use for future stimulus money coming to the state, if there is. I mean, I know there's, the pros and cons on that. Uh, I, I want to be able to have a more deliberative approach from a legislative process to be able to have a seat at the table. I, I think giving any one entity, whether it be the legislature or the or the governor or whoever, uh, complete authority is always dangerous and, and doesn't deliver the best product. Yeah, and with that, um, I know the original federal bill said that that money had to be spent by the end of the year. Um, you know, one point seven five has been billion has been allocated, but only a fraction of it's been actually spent. Um, do we have any idea if that money just even if it's allocated but not spent, does it go away 
Uh, do we really have any answers on, is this going to cause us any structural you know, deficit problems down the road? Well, I think that's that's the concern, as I mentioned earlier, that you know we can't use that money. I mean, although all that money should be used for one-time costs, not not ongoing expenses, because unfortunately that, that was what was done under the Doyle administration in, in the last recession, and that's what created that huge budget hole that the Walker administration had to deal with when they're coming coming into office. Um, you know, uh, once again, that's it's all completely at the discretion of, of the governor. Um, I don't know that, um, I don't, we don't necessarily, he doesn't share as much information with us as we would like. I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Um, we we want to have a, I mean, I think we've, we've demonstrated uh, the decisions that we've made and from a budgetary standpoint have been uh, beneficial for, for him. I mean, hey, they just not, not expending all those resources, not expending all those dollars uh, in the past, in this budget that was passed uh, last July, actually gave Tony Evers a lot more ability to maneuver this COVID world we're in too. So I would hope there'd be somewhat of a mutual respect there to be able to understand that, um, you know, we both bring something to the table here and can have discussions uh, about those resources, uh, how they best can be spent, how they don't have a significant impact on on, uh, ongoing expenses uh, and make our decisions in the next budget even more difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You'd mentioned uh, transportation. the gas tax, I think, is down 43 million or something year to date. And like you said, registrations, everything else are down as well. Um, you know, I think last session, the legislature took a look at uh, shortfall in the transportation fund. Um, there were some new fees and some increases there. But, um, you know, I think there was a hope that we could maybe bypass this issue for a little bit. Is this something that is going to be another major issue for the Joint Finance Committee again that you're going to have to address? Well, I'm sure it always will. However, um, just a basic principle of fair play, I will say. I mean, maybe that's not a great way to describe it, but to expect to go back to the people for higher taxes, higher fees, whatever you want to call it in an environment where, you know, our unemployment's gone way up, even even though it's stabilized recently, it's not as bad as it was, um, where revenues are down, you know, I, I'm not going to be a proponent of increasing the cost of doing business for the citizens of Wisconsin um, at all. I mean, we're going to have to have those conversations, of course, and be able to prioritize. But I don't believe that, you know, when you're in the middle of a, a economic downturn as significant as we're, as we're facing right now, that expecting the whims of government to go on, you know, Without without any pain and to have it all felt by the citizens of the state uh, is, is definitely not something I will ever uh, want to support. So if that means that uh, you know, I don't know, flat. I don't. Know, from my perspective, when we increase the title registration or title fee in this last budget, I didn't see that even then. From that time, as a uh, a first step towards. Um, you know, coming back next time for even a higher increase to other gas tax or something else. You and I talked a little bit more recently. I mean, uh, you know, in developing a budget, you you know, developing a budget is very complicated and you got to take all the different factors and play the different senators, the representatives, the Republicans, the Democrats, the citizens of Wisconsin. Uh, we all might have different ideas about what's fair. Uh, I've been, as, as, as Representative Voss, Speaker Voss, been supportive of a more uh, a, a fee-based idea, concept. Those who use the roads should pay the most for the roads. And, and um, I, that's where I've been supportive of some type of toll-based system, and I, and I know Badger Institute as well. Um, so if we're going to have a conversation about you know transportation dollars again in the future, uh, I don't see it as a, a plus one. I see it as maybe a way to... Uh, reduce costs elsewhere in uh, in transportation, especially in this environment we're in today. Glad to hear you say that because yeah, it's. I mean, I think just going forward, I think we're going to see a big change in the gas tax overall because as cars get more fuel efficient, and then there's hybrids and electrics that are not going to be paying for their right. portion of the roads that they use. Um, you know, we have to look for other options out there. So um, glad to hear you bring that yeah. up. I, I, hey, I drive a hybrid. I mean, I do it because I can get better, better gas mileage, but I also know that I'm not paying my fair share uh, for the, the roads. And that's one of the reasons why I don't have a problem. We created that hybrid fee uh, to be able to you know, kind of uh, balance the playing field a little bit so everybody's paying their fair share. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned earlier um, the possibilities of a budget repair bill. You're hoping that it's going to be unlikely. Um, if you had to put odds on it, um, I mean, is it kind of dependent on, I know we're waiting on the July tax number. So is that going to kind of be a dependent factor? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that I don't want one. I mean, first of all, I've been doing this since 2013 as co-chair. We've never had one. Um, when I first got elected, we were doing a budget repair. I think that first session uh, under Governor Doyle, I think we did two uh, within the first session, maybe even three. Um, and then that was a, a regular occurrence for uh, until Walker administration came in, quite honestly. Um, and so we haven't had one, so I don't really look forward to having that conversation. However, uh, what I guess I would leave, try to, I've been trying to get across to anybody that's listening, is decisions made today, whether it be a budget repair bill, whether it be holding revenue, holding uh, expenditures flat uh, in the second year of the budget versus the first year, um, anything else that can be done to reduce expenses today will make the 2021, 2023, um, budget conversations much easier, less painful. And I think those, those conversations should be had. So I, in this environment, I might say a budget repair might be a, a good thing, but you know that it's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily, a, it isn't a decision that for the legislature is completely under the, uh, once again, uh, has to be initiated by the administration. Uh, so I do think those revenues uh, that we, we see um, could have a significant factor in whether the governor decides to uh, implement a, uh, introduce some type of budget repair process. And obviously, since it's more up to them and, and we don't really know the full picture yet, has there been any, you know, timeline? Is this something we'd be looking at after the election or is this something maybe once the new year starts and we have a little bit better picture of the budget finances? I actually think, I actually think from a timing standpoint, uh, I, I think you're more likely to see if you're going to see some type of budget repair. I do think it'll be later in the, uh, later in the year. Um, um, not, not necessarily in the next uh, couple months. I think it would be more likely October, November that you would see some type of budget repair if you see one at all. Um, and then just on those, has there been any indication yet on what the July tax numbers look like? Have there been any preliminary numbers that you've seen? I know we're still waiting for the official ones to come out, but is there any talk right now of what we're looking at? Well, I think that it has been better uh, than we had originally anticipated. Um, that uh, we've, we've seen some strong uh, sales tax. I mean, of course, there are se there's segments that are down. Um, uh, but uh, we've seen strong corporate. So I, I think you'll, you'll, once again, the picture is not as bleak as it was in, in uh, April. Uh, so I, I think the numbers, are, in my opinion, are, are fairly strong. I'm not gonna um, you know, play Bob Lang's uh, uh, role in this conversation, but I, I do think that at the end of the day, we're gonna see a, a, a strong ending balance based on better than expected uh, revenues. Uh, in the uh, in the last budget that'll prepare us to uh, roll into the next budget uh, next, the second year of the budget uh, what we're, we'll see once again based on projections a significant uh, negative uh, revenues that'll make it more difficult but, but the goal is to get to a point where between the first year ending balance and the second year of the budget be as close to even as possible uh, if not and, that, and that's close to even as possible without making any type of significant changes like a, as a budget repair. If we may, if we do a budget repair, the goal would be to end the second year of the budget with a higher ending balance. Uh, the way we're looking, I think, would be closer to even or slightly down in the second year. And that would be without even uh, impacting the rainy day fund, which is great. Let's leave that intact as much as possible um, so that it uh, gives us more flexibility in the next budget. However, uh, you heard me say this 20 times now, decisions today will make it easier for us to, you know, if we, if we get aggressive on reducing expenditures today, will make it much easier for us to not have to make significant cuts in the next budget. If you're, if you're a public school administrator, um, you know, whoever that gets resources from, um, from the state, I think you want us to be aggressive today because that means we won't have to be as aggressive in the next budget. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Shifting to uh, Medicaid and BadgerCare Plus a little bit here, you you mentioned the increase. Um, it's up thir- uh, BadgerCare Plus enrollment is up thirteen percent, um, projected to go to twenty two percent since the pandemic started. Um, the last budget just cost to continue. Um, I think um, the budget anticipated a zero percent increase. Um, Utilization is not where it is because a lot of people aren't going to the doctor, but once they do start actually utilizing those services. Um, do we have any projection on what that's going to look like and what that dollar figure could possibly be? Because $324 million just to have a flat level is, uh, you know, could spell quite a bit of money if it's a 20 plus percent increase. Yeah, no, I, we don't have any firm numbers yet. I think they would all be, I mean, we, we could do the math and, and try and figure it out based, you know, based on um, enrollments and, and based on history. But uh that is going to be the Medicaid budget is going to be the biggest uh, variable in this conversation, which that budget then affects everything else. Because as we talked about, that's been the biggest uh, drain from GPI spending in the, in the, in the not so much the last budget, last couple of budgets, but going back to the, that recession in 2011, um, that's, I think it was like a billion dollars that had to be taken from other places uh, to keep, you know, Medicaid uh, solvent. So, um, you know, we, I would, I would just say stay tuned, but that's the, uh, the biggest variable that we're going to face. Yeah. Um, a lot of that increase in enrollment is just from the states. You know, normally we have pretty strong controls on making sure that the people who are on it are meeting the requirements. Um, after a year, you get reassessed. Um, but the federal CARES bill, in order to get that FMAP money, I think we had to comply with certain federal rules that basically said your enrollment controls kind of have to be suspended for a little bit. And I know there was an emergency and everyone was kind of worried about what was happening. But um, is there a plan to kind of get some of those controls back in place and make sure that the people who are on it really need it as opposed to um, some people that have just kind of slipped beneath the cracks? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a significant uh, question and an and important factor for us. And that, that's one of the worries about federal resources and federal money in, in general is it always comes with the, you know, hoops you got to jump through to be able to get it. And if the money's temporary, those changes should be temporary. Um, so I think that's as, as quickly as we can get those um, levers that the state government does have in place again, so that we can make sure that the hey, if, if, that resources are going where they need to. I don't think anybody has ever begrudged anybody who needs uh, assistance from the state. Um, but it, you know, we still have even though we've got a high, higher unemployment, we still have a lot of employers who are still looking for in segments that are still looking for good people. Um, and the, the more we can use. You know, Medicaid as a way to launch people into the world of unemployment or world of employment, uh, the better off we're going to be. So, yes, we want to get those controls back in place as quickly as we possibly can. I, I think one of the questions comes into play is that that's where we're sitting watching to see what the federal government does on round two. But everything I've been hearing, and I think you probably heard it as well, seems to be that uh, anything round two might be stimulus to individual taxpayers, uh, but no state funding uh, is uh, is imminent at this point in time. Which, you know what, uh, I mean, I, I've i got colleagues who, I mean, they that signed a letter to the federal government asking not for not to have state bailouts, and, I, and I'm I'm understanding of why they asked for that. Um, we don't want, the, you know, Wisconsin's done good work over the years about you know managing our budgets and getting ourselves into a better fiscal place, where some of our neighbors, you know, especially the South, have you know continued to go down a path of spending more resources than they have. You know, um, their pension system's way out of whack. They haven't made those tough decisions that we have. We don't want our tax uh, dollars as, as federal taxpayers to go bail out states who haven't made good decisions. So while, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of, the, of that, um, that mindset, I think we, you know, we have to be mindful of what might come from the federal government uh, in, in another round of, of, uh, of legislation. But everything that appears, at least conversations that are coming out of the federal government, is any future rounds would not have any state resources or money going to the state government to, to quote unquote, bail them out. So there's no no plan to have, you know, a boatload of resources just kind of piled on our budget going into the next uh, round of deliberations. Okay. Um, continuing on the Medicaid uh, track, obviously, I think we're all anticipating Governor Evers is going to call for Medicaid expansion again um, as his solution. Um, do you want to kind of talk on that and what the, sure. what the legislature's position is there and then what your plans are? 
So I don't, first of all, I don't see I don't see anybody's position changing on this this at all. I mean, I expect Governor Evers, as long as I'm, I'm around in the legislature, I ex- expect that to continue to be as long as we have a Democrat governor and Republican legislature. I continue to expect to see that proposal coming forward. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's not talked about though, it, first of all, it's a three hundred million dollars. Three hundred million dollars is the number that's tossed around coming to us um, in increased Medicaid reimbursements uh, for the state now. First of all, that's really a one-time number. It's not one-time, but it is. Because once it's there, it's built into the base going forward. And you know, all those dollars are going to continue to be spent from budget to budget. So it's really a one-time windfall on your on your budget decisions that you have to be, that you can have those resources. Um, now, there's something that's oftentimes not discussed that is, is, that is very, very important as well. First of all, Medicaid reimburses at, at less than cost in a lot of situations. It's one of the probably the biggest things we're lobbied on over and over again, whether it be hospitals, whether it be uh, nursing homes, whether it be dentists, you, you name it. Uh, the budget committee is, is lobbied to increase reimbursement rates for Medicaid because uh, these providers are, are also oftentimes losing money on providing the service for the people on Medicaid. So it under reimburses. Um, why would we want to put uh, more people onto a program that under reimburses uh, for the, the the care, which would then require us to put more GPR into reimbursement rates, right? Which okay, the reason to get Medicaid expansion is to get the increased uh, reimbursement rates. We're still doing it. At, at the same time, that is a segment. You know, it's 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 people in poverty. Still, anybody over the poverty rate is going to private insurance, uh, where they get a subsidy from the federal government. Private insurance reimburses at at more at a commercial market or not more at a commercial reimbursement rate, which is, which the providers can make profit from, or at least break even from why we want to take people off of that and put them onto the system that under reimburses and then require additional GPR. So um, I guess uh, just to be clear on what I'm, what I'm saying here is you have to count those, those numbers count too. the increased dollars that go to the, uh, the person buying insurance on the private ex- the private market through the exchange, um, which reimburses at, at commercial rates. Uh, those numbers have to be taken into consideration on the overall comparison between that $300 million that, that's coming into the state from the federal government um, and the, those dollars that are going to the individual and to the, and to the providers. And at the same time, I also fear, I mean, this has been, my background is health insurance uh, uh, agent, um, I also fear making our health insurance market less competitive as well, taking lives out of the fully insured market and putting them into Medicaid uh, reduces the number of people on private insurance, reduces the pool. The way insurance works, it's spreading the risk out to as many people as possible. So taking people off, off of that private insurance, um, making that pool stronger or smaller, I have fear that, uh, you know, there'd be less uh, opportunity for competition, um, which would further exacerbate the problem. Um, so I, I think you're going to continue to see the Republican legislature continue to uh, support the system we have. You know, I, I know that some of my Democrat friends will say, like, you, you, export, uh, you, you support Obamacare? Well, go back to when Obamacare was passed. No, we didn't. But it's the law of the land. And we'll take Obamacare, which is private uh, private Obamacare exchanges, which is private insurance, we'll take that choice over putting all these folks on Medicaid any single day of the year. Because um, if we don't, more people on Medicaid under reimbursed, more more money has to go into that program from uh, from those that are actually on private insurance. And at the same time, making their pool smaller, which drive, potentially drives up their costs more as well. So the people who are paying are paying twice. That's not that those aren't good good choices. So we're going to continue down the path we've been on. Excellent. Um, you mentioned the rainy day fund earlier, uh, being at the highest level it's ever been. Um, was slated to be higher, but but still sitting with uh, quite a bit of money. Um, what do you see as some of the priorities in the next budget if we do tap into those funds? Well, yeah. Number one goal is not to touch it at all. I mean that that would be the that would be the goal. Yeah. Uh, whether that whether that's reality or not is probably you know probably overly optimistic. Um, I think it has to be used as a way to offset um, cuts to things that are priorities. And when I say cuts, you know, if it's K-12 education, for example, you know, let, let's just be honest, a cut is not holding it flat where it is today, right? That's not a cut. Um, 
so reducing cuts to things that are priorities, uh, I think is going to be a priority. Um, using it as a way to offset any need for any uh, fee or revenue in, uh, or tax increases definitely going to be, be a priority. Using those dollars like uh, like we've traditionally managed our budgets in the past, I, I don't think we're going to change course. It's going to we're going to be very judicious about how those dollars are used. Uh, it's not simply going to be a you know, plug it into the budget and then spend however you want. We're going to we're going to make decisions that are going to put us in a better position to get out of this uh, economic downturn uh, and prepare us for prosperity in the future. Um, speaking of uh, K-12 funding, uh, obviously a lot of debate right now over whether or not schools are going to open or not, um, you know, virtual versus in-class. Is there going to be a discussion on kind of what funding levels will be like based on that? I mean, you know, some of the administrative folks that maybe aren't engaging on the online portals, stuff like that. Is, are there opportunities to maybe save some dollars with, with what we're facing in K-12? So I'm not uh, I met with one of my school boards recently um, in administration, Howard Swamico, which is one of the more conservative school districts in the state from a budgetary standpoint. And, you know, they talked about their increased cost, PPE, uh, all those, you know, um, having uh, higher costs on substitute teachers because as a, as a substitute or as a teacher gets uh, you know, test positive, then they got to bring a sub in and, you know, they're still paying that person that's uh, is under contract. Um, so some of those things are all things we don't take into consideration. Um, I made the point to them that, you know, these increased costs are not truly in, uh, appreciated by the public. Your, your point uh, is spot on. The public's going to perceive that if we're doing education all online, there should be reduced costs, not increased costs. So that's, I, first of all, I need a, a better sense of comfort level, understanding what these additional costs are talking about actually are. Uh, it can't be, we're not going to just simply take your word for it. You need to show us what these increased costs are so that we can uh, truly appreciate it. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, first of all, I, I think parents, an expectation from parents are that their kids' education is not um, penalized based on the COVID world we're in. And I think also parents' ex uh, uh, most parents expect some type of in-person education options. Not to say that that's the choice that they're going to make, but that option uh, for them to be able to utilize that. Um, I was really kind of upset, frustrated, disheartened with the county decision on uh, Friday where basically mandated that all education need to be in, in person. I should say all, but uh, certain grades, uh, on the, uh, or all, I'm sorry, needs to be online. There were public, there were private schools that were already operating that already opened for the year. There are other private schools that are maybe going that went in yesterday, and they announced this on uh, late on the day on Friday, um, and take those options away from parents. Um, you know what? The parents still are in the best. Whether it's you know this isn't a time to talk about you know uh, school choice versus public education as a competition, but this is a, this is a time where you still want to give parents as many choices as they possibly can. Um, and if they want their kids in an in-person education, whether that be you know, through open enrollment or whether it be through school choice or that be utilizing their own resources to pay for tuition at a, at a, at a private school, they should be able to have that. And um, Dane County acting, especially as late as they possibly did, really took those options away from them. Yeah, definitely. Um, kind of along the same vein, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about state employees who have been working from home you know, with varying levels of uh, whatever the productivity is. Um, uh, is there any going to be a look at the hiring freeze, looking at some of the positions that haven't been filled as a way of cost savings, and reducing those? But then also I know in the past under the Doyle years, you know, there was state employee furloughs at times like this. Um, has there been any discussions about that or how we're going to address those situations? So, I mean, furlough... Pearls, I guess, are always an option, but I would prefer to have a, actually a real conversation. Um, sorry, my phone's ringing here. Um, I would prefer to have a real conversation about, you know, going back to what you're talking about. Uh, first of all, productivity, making sure that people that are working from home are as productive. We need to take a look at that, get as much data as we possibly can to make, make sure they're continuing to be um, an asset for the taxpayers, not a, uh, you know, not a 50% asset, but a full 100% asset for the taxpayers. Um, but at the same time, looking at a number of positions, you know, we've kind of set the um, policy with the Evers administration. Anytime he comes with any type of, uh, other than through the, through the COVID response, uh, with a increase in positions, um, 
we want to see a, a uh, offset in reductions in positions somewhere else. So don't because you look you look at the uh, position reports that are out there. There's hundreds of if not thousands of positions that go unfilled uh, by the administration that they simply, the dollars are allocated for those positions, but they simply use as a way to, to uh, you know, get more resources, keep their resources, keep their budgets balanced within those, within those administrative agencies. So I guarantee uh, it's been a priority of mine since I began this process that even under Governor Walker, we said, you know, we're, we're we're ending up the budget with fewer positions than we start uh, in this world. Uh, you know, the new conversation definitely about productivity has to be part of it because I don't know about you, but working from home, working from home is great. And there's, there's definitely pluses and minuses to it um, for, from a productivity standpoint. But it, when the taxpayer is the one footing the bill, uh, it's, it's up to us to ask those questions about what kind of uh, outcomes is actually taking place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of along that line too, uh, with UW, uh, you said that the first round of cuts by the administration were mostly centered on them. Since then, uh, Governor Thompson, now the president of the UW system, is asking for, um, I think, a three and a half percent increase in spending. Uh, what are your kind of thoughts there? Uh, also, it's going to be kind of like K twelve. I mean, are they going to be virtual or are they going to be in person? Um, you know, what do what do you think you see there with uh, what's going to happen this fall? Well, I think the good news. I mean, first of all, Ray Cross, I thought was a upstanding guy. Did a, did a nice job. Um, but he probably, you know, he, he came from academia, um, is, was, was while he was a, uh, a good, uh, president of the system did, did a nice job. I think having Tommy there is more likely to, we're actually more likely to have conversations about kind of upsetting the apple cart to a certain extent, actually making the tough decisions that are going to put us in a position of, uh, from UW to be not just make it through this budget to be, put, but to be in a better position long-term. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful. And I think there's going to be a more of a trust level with, with Tommy there uh, from the Republican legislature than there's been in the past, which that's, that's all that I think that's all helpful yet. You know, three and a half percent increase. Uh, I talked to uh, Tommy and I talked to Dean Stensberg, who's always been his right hand man over the of wherever he's gone. He's he's with him at the system uh, uh, again. Uh, you know, we're going to have to weigh that in the totality of the entire budget. Um, you know, we're, we can't. Uh, we're not going to make a, a promise to the UW system just because Tommy Thompson is the uh, the pres you know, interim president of the system. We're going to have to make make decisions that are right for the state of Wisconsin. Um, and and the, there's going to be some tough questions. You know, I've got I've got a student at GW Stevens Point, and I've my my wife was telling me my wife was an educator. She's a public school teacher. She's in a um, a chat group with uh, parents of UW Stevens Point uh, kids. And there's, there's questions like, you know, why are we paying an online fee uh, for our kids to get virtual education when we actually are paying for them to be in a classroom? What, what, what's the additional cost? I mean, that's where, you know, it's where a citizen legislature where maybe there's an answer for that. Um, that, that makes sense, but that's where a citizen legislature and coming from a, our, you know, a, just a family perspective actually is helpful. So we, we have the ability to ask those questions of the, the, those in power um, at, at the system, whereas the average citizen doesn't. And there's going to be some, yeah, there's going to have to be some tough decisions and, and for the system, there's going to have to be tough decisions for us as, as legislators. Um, but we're not going to simply, you know, just because, you know, Tommy's there and, and his budget, I think, address some uh, issues that are important for us as a state uh you know there's a number of key conversations the things they provided resources for whether it be you know uh, substance abuse i know they talked about teacher shortage other other things that you know have kind of been hot button conversations for us in, in wisconsin that's all good stuff but that doesn't just simply mean because they're they're looking to fund good stuff that we're simply going to say yes to it automatically it'll, it'll be uh, it'll be weighed in the totality of the resources that the people in Wisconsin give us without going back to them asking for more, whether it be tuition, fees, increased taxes, et cetera. Okay, great. Um, yeah, we're coming up on 11 o'clock. Uh, this has been fantastic. I just wanna say thank you for joining us. I think uh, just looking at the participant level, everyone stayed on right until just about now. So um, I think everyone got a lot of information, a lot of questions we didn't get to, unfortunately, just because there was so much information out there. But uh, hopefully we can do this uh, again in the future with either yourself or other members of the committee. Like I said, we're asking for the administration to join us as well for one of these. Um, so thank you for everybody who participated. Um, again, uh, if you have questions that didn't get answered, uh, you can submit them to info at badgerinstitute.org or engage with us on Facebook or Twitter. We'd be happy to try and get those answers and see if we can get as many answers as we possibly can. But 
Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Representative Nigren, and uh, everyone have a fantastic day.